Alternatives to scientific animal use include the replacement, refinement and reduction of animal use. And these were first described by uh, Russell and Birch in their famous 1959 book, The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique. Replacement refers to the replacement of animals with non-animal alternatives. Reduction refers to the minimisation of animal numbers. And refinement uh, refers to the minimisation of pain or stress or other adverse effects and to the maximisation of well-being uh, over the course of the animal's lifetimes. Russell and Birch were clear that replacement was the most important of the three R's. First of all, before any new research is contemplated, there needs to be better sharing and assessment of existing data. A great deal of existing data about the toxicity and biological activity of chemicals is locked up in the commercial files of chemical and drug companies. This, of course, is contrary to the public interest when toxicity data about chemicals is not released and when drug development is delayed as a result. So there need to be better regulatory and policy mechanisms to encourage the sharing and assessment of existing data before any new research is contemplated. There should be a thorough evaluation of the physical and chemical characteristics of test compounds to determine things such as their likely solubility in the bloodstream. Computer simulations include things like structure activity relationships which aim to predict biological activities on the basis of chemical structure and also expert systems that use known rules about toxicity uh, to try to predict the toxicity of new test compounds. Cell cultures include bacterial, yeast, protozoal, mammalian and even human cell cultures. Single layers of cell cultures or monolayers often don't live for very long. These can be immortalised uh, via various mechanisms in the laboratory. We can also use uh, tumour cells that endlessly reproduce themselves. Embryonic and adult stem cells are very interesting scientifically because they differentiate into all other known tissue types. Organotypic cultures are no longer single monolayers of cells but start to produce some of the three-dimensional architecture uh, to be found in the original organs from which the cells are sourced. These cell cultures may be used individually or combined within batteries of cell cultures and this increases the spectrum of toxins that may be detected because one petri dish may detect a certain kind of toxin, cells in another may respond to other types of toxins. Cell cultures may be used static or perfused. With perfusion cultures, toxins or potential toxins are washed over the cells for a period of time which allows the termination of things like time period to the onset of toxicity, duration of toxicity and the magnitude of toxicity in the cells that are being assessed. Liver cells are extremely important because the liver is the organ in the body that has the primary responsibility for dealing with foreign compounds, for using its enzymes to convert them into new compounds which are metabolites that hopefully are non-toxic to the body and soluble in the bloodstream so that they can pass to the kidneys for excretion out of the body. So cultures of liver cells are very important. An exciting alternative to animal use is the so-called human on a chip. Now this is a plastic wafer with tiny wells in the plastic and in those wells are inserted cell cultures with the cells being sourced from important organs in the human body such as the liver, such as the central nervous system and such as the heart. And these wells are connected via a tiny microcirculatory system so it's possible to expose the liver cells to a potential toxin, see what kind of metabolites are produced, have them circulate to the heart cells and to the brain cells via the tiny microcirculatory system, and to see what the effects would be on uh, potentially the other organs in the human body. Cell cultures have the advantage of producing results much more quickly, much more cheaply, and much more predictively for human outcomes. Gene chips are plastic wafers with hundreds or thousands of spots of DNA on them. Now when cells are exposed to potential toxins, this can cause certain genes to become more active and others to become deactivated. The active genes produce messenger RNA that floats around inside the cell. And it's possible to then mash up the cells in blenders and to wash that fluid over the, all of the spots of DNA on the gene chips. So the mRNA attaches to certain spots of DNA indicating which genes have actually been activated in the cell after exposure to the toxin. 
Now when the mRNA binds to these spots of DNA, it causes fluorescence. So these chips can be viewed under an ultraviolet light to see which spots fluoresce, which indicates which genes have been turned on by the toxin. This field is termed toxicogenomics, the study of which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off by exposure to toxins. And it's possible to build up profiles of known human toxins and then to take an unknown chemical and do the same thing and compare its uh, gene expression pattern with those of the known toxins and make predictions about the toxicity of the unknown chemical. Studying the genomes allowed detection of potential toxins well prior to more invasive endpoints such as damage starting to occur to entire cells, entire organs or animals or people for that matter. Human-based studies are of course an important alternative to animal use. Human clinical trials are routinely conducted anyway uh, when new test drugs are first introduced to human beings. The trouble with human clinical trials is that uh, they're known for using small populations of healthy young males and they're not very predictive for more diverse human populations including older and younger people and women. The study durations used are also often quite short. So accordingly, toxic effects are often not detected very well in these human clinical trials, which results in a large proportion of these drugs being recalled after being released into the wider marketplace when the toxic effects become evident. So to increase the predictivity of these human clinical trials, we should use more diverse study populations and longer study periods. It's also possible to increase the safety of human clinical trials for the human volunteers that participate. Microdosing involves the use of doses below those expected to have any biological effects in order to simply track the distribution of molecules around the body and determine which organs are likely to be affected by the compounds. Staggered dosing involves dosing the human volunteers not all at the same time, but uh, one by one. And this means that if there are toxic effects, uh, they should become apparent before the whole sample has been dosed. Reduction can be intra-experimental, extra-experimental or supra-experimental. Intra-experimental reduction applies at the level of the experiment directly. An important aspect of this is sample size calculation. Often an arbitrary number of animals is selected uh, for use in an experiment. But selecting too many animals wastes animal lives and scientific resources. Selecting too few animals means that the results cannot be reliably extrapolated to the wider animal population, let alone to human beings. Accordingly, it's important to use a proper statistical method to actually calculate the sample size that should be used, but very commonly this is not done. Super-experimental reduction involves changes at the institution at which the animals are being used, so this might refer to a number of different experiments uh, using the same group of animals as a control group uh, to which nothing is done rather than all having a separate control group in order to decrease numbers. Extra experimental reduction refers to wider societal changes that can impact on the numbers of animals used such as the harmonisation of international animal testing regulations. Refinement of laboratory animal use can involve the use of painkillers and anaesthetics. Unfortunately though, large-scale studies have indicated that the level of use of painkillers and anaesthetics is often far below that which is warranted. Environmental enrichment is important. Most laboratory animals spend most of their lives in relatively barren, small, standardised cages. Studies have indicated that this has adverse impacts on things like the cerebrocortical thickness and weight, uh, memory, learning, and behaviour of the animals. It also stresses the animals. This means that experiments that rely upon measuring physiological parameters, studying behaviour, studying neurological function, uh, can potentially all give distorted results.